In this lesson, we're going to look at half-life, which is linked to radioactivity. First, we're going to describe what is meant by background radiation. Then we're going to explain the term half-life and how to calculate it. And finally, explain how to interpret decay curves or half-life graphs. The concept of half-life is great at teaching us how something completely random can be very predictable. In fact, so predictable that we can use the idea of half-life to quite accurately age fossils and other historical artefacts. The best analogy for this is looking at some bubbles in foam. We know as a certainty that at some point all of these bubbles will pop. We just don't know which one will pop and when it will pop, but you can see they're starting to pop randomly. However, although which bubble pops and when it pops is random, the rate at which these bubbles disappear is predictable. By observing how quickly these bubbles pop, I could probably give an estimate, a fairly accurate estimate, of how much time it will take before, let's say, half the foam disappears, and maybe until pretty much all of the foam disappears. This illustrates the idea of half-life quite nicely, and we'll go on to that in just a minute but keep this in mind. So we are surrounded by radiation, and we call this radiation, this environmental radiation, background radiation. This can be described as the low-level radiation that is always around us due to a number of things. And you will need to recall these in your exams. The ones to really remember are radon gas, because that takes up about 50% of our background radiation. Radon gas is released from rocks. It's an alpha source of radiation. But also, uh, our food, such as coffee and bananas, can often have a relatively high radioactive count. Cosmic rays from the sun, gamma rays. Also, nuclear medicine, such as radiotherapy, so medical sources. And surprisingly, and reassuringly, nuclear power only takes up a thin sliver of this pie chart. So if you're worried that nuclear power will increase background radiation levels, it won't, not significantly. It's important to remember medical and nuclear power because these are man-made sources, whereas the others are natural sources of radiation. If I was to remember any of these, I'd definitely remember radon gas as the lead contributor, and I'd also remember nuclear power and medical because they're two man-made sources of radiation. So if you held your Geiger Muller tube or Geiger counter basically up in the air, it will still start to click. And this is because it's detecting background radiation. But here's an important point. Background radiation levels aren't constant. Depending on where you live, they can actually vary quite a bit. For example, if you lived in Cornwall in England, there is a higher level of radon gas due to the rocks. Many people build their homes on top of these rocks and therefore are subject to higher levels of background radiation because of the radon gas. And that's how you describe what is meant by background radiation. So now let's go back to the key question, what is half-life? If you remember at the start of this presentation, I had a picture of a clock. Well, that's the key thing to remember because half-life is a measure of time. So it's the time taken for half of the undecayed radioisotopes in a sample to decay. So remember, if you are calculating a half-life, you are calculating time. So firstly, let's zoom into an atom. And inside an atom, you would find the nucleus. Now, an unstable nucleus will try to eject matter from itself to basically become stable. So let's say this has just ejected an alpha particle. So this atom has now decayed. Because it has lost two protons, and remember the number of protons defines what an element is, because the proton number or the atomic number has now changed, we now have a new element. So let's zoom back out. So in this example, I'm looking at the decay of a specific radioisotope of platinum, which will decay into gold. You can see at the start, I have 16 atoms of radioactive platinum. But if I came back 10 days later to read the radioactivity level, I'll find that only half the radioactivity remains. In other words, half of these atoms, eight atoms, have decayed and become gold. If I came back 10 days later, I see another half has decayed. So we had eight remaining, but now we only have four remaining because four more have decayed into gold. And 10 days later, a half has decayed again. So before I had four, now I only have two platinum atoms because another two have decayed into gold. So every 10 days, this sample is basically losing half of its radioactivity. 
In other words, every 10 days, half of the undecayed radioisotopes decay. So the half-life of this radioisotope, this platinum, would be 10 days. As I said, half-life is a measure of time, be it milliseconds, seconds, minutes, months, years, it doesn't matter. So we can count this in a number of ways. For example, I'm looking at the number of undecayed nuclei, so 16 here, 8 here, 4 here, 2 here, halving each time. But you could also do a count of radioactivity. For example, you could hold a GM tube up to this, which will start clicking away, and it will give you a reading in a unit called Becquerels, or BQ. So we can see we have 120 Becquerels here, 60 here, which is halved, 30 here, which is halved again, and 15 here, which is halved again. Becquerels is a unit of radioactivity. One Becquerel equals one decay per second. In other words, one Becquerel is when one radioactive particle enters the GM tube and causes the ionization of an atom. Whereas 50 Becquerels would be 50 ionization events detected by our GM tube. The half-life of some radioisotopes is incredibly short, less than a second. But for others, it can be incredibly long, over millions of years. And there are very useful practical applications of half-life. For example, let's say we've discovered this fossil of an ancient crocodile. We could use our GM tube to get a radioactive reading from this crocodile and use that to work out how old this fossil is. How is that possible? Well, firstly, you may have heard that we are carbon-based life forms, and that's because we have a lot of carbon in our body. Our body is filled with different isotopes of carbon, but also it includes one radioactive isotope of carbon called carbon-14. Now, we will get rid of carbon-14 from our body as waste, for example, when we breathe out carbon dioxide and other forms of waste. But we replenish the carbon-14 lost from our food. So overall, we get a fairly constant level of carbon-14 relative to other carbon isotopes in our body. So in other words, the levels of carbon-14 radioactive carbon in a living thing does not go down. Well, not relative to other carbon isotopes. For example, if you were starving yourself, yes, you would get less carbon-14, but you'd also get less other carbon isotopes, so relatively they'd still say the same value. But let's say our crocodile dies. Well, now the radioactive clock starts. You see, the crocodile will not be taking in any fresh supply of carbon-14 and will not be getting rid of it as waste because they're dead. This means that all the carbon-14 atoms or radioisotopes in the crocodile's body have left to do is decay. Now the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. In other words, it takes that long for half of the undecayed carbon-14 isotopes to decay. So we'll assume at day zero, the radioactivity count is 100% of expected levels. And let's say, as a reading in terms of radioactivity, we have 800 becquerels, or we could say the mass of carbon-14 is 6 milligrams. There are different ways of reading how much isotope is in our body. And you all need to be flexible with this because they can challenge you with using any of these in an exam. So if our fossil only had 12.5% of the expected amount of radioactive carbon-14 in its body, we can actually estimate its age. You see, if we work in reverse, we know that the next stage up, doubling this 12.5 rather than halving it because we're working upwards, would be 25%. And we know that would have taken one half-life. 5,730 years. Then going from 25 to 50%, again doubling, because we're going in reverse, would be another 5,730 years. Then from 50 to 100%, another 5,730 years. In other words, since it's died, three half-lives have passed. One, two, three. So, in other words, 5,730 plus 5,730 plus 5,730 will give you an age of 22,920 years, approximately. Now, you need to be quite flexible in your ability to calculate half-life because they can test you in a number of ways. So, I'll give you some examples of this. It could be in a question that you have to work out the final radioactivity in Becquerels or the final mass left of a radioisotope in a sample. And you will know the elapsed time, how much time has passed, um, the half-life, how long it is, or, and the starting radioactivity or the starting mass. For example, a radioactive sample gives a reading of 15 becquerels. If the radioisotope has a half-life of 10 days, what reading would you expect in 30 days? So we have the starting radioactivity, we have the half-life of 10 days, 
And we have the elapsed time, how much time has passed, 30 days, or will pass. So what we need to find out is the final radioactivity count. Now people have their own methods of doing this, but I always like using this diagram. I like to draw everything out. So we know that we're starting with 15 becquerels, and we know that 30 days have passed and the half-life is 10 days. So let's count out 30 days, one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives. That gives us 30 days. Each half-life, this count will be halving. Okay, so 15 divided by 2 would be 7.5, then divided by 2 would be 3.75, then divided by 2 would be 1.875 becquerels, and that's your answer. Don't get worried about doing this in your exam. Do it like this if it helps. It won't cost you any marks. In another example, you may have to calculate the starting radioactivity rather than the final radioactivity or the starting mass. It would be the same sort of calculation. Uh, here you'll be given the half-life, maybe the number of half-lives, and the final radioactivity or mass. For example, a sample contains 6 milligrams of a radioisotope with a half-life of 4 seconds. What would the mass of the radioisotope have been, assuming 3 half-lives have passed? Once again, I like to use the same diagram. We know that we are ending with 6 milligrams, and we know 3 half-lives have passed, which are 4 seconds. So we just go 3 half-lives back. 1, 2, 3. Each time now we are doubling rather than halving, because we're working backwards. So one half-life double, 12 milligrams. Another half-life doubled again, 24 milligrams. Another one, 48 milligrams. We're just doubling three times. And that would be your answer. In my third and final example, you may have to calculate the half-life itself. Here you'll be given the elapsed time, how much time has passed, the starting radioactivity or mass, and the final radioactivity or mass. For example, a radioisotope has a count of 80 becquerels. After 90 minutes, it has a count of 10 becquerels. What is the half-life of this radioisotope? So we have the starting and the final radioactivity, and we have the elapsed time, how long it took to get from one to the other. So we know we're starting with 80, and we know that 90 minutes has passed, and we know we end up with 10. So we just have to get from 80 to 10 by halving and halving and halving. So one halving would be one half-life's worth of work. So from 80 to 40 would be one half-life, from 40 to 20 would be another half-life, and from 20 to 10, another half-life. So we know three half-lives have passed to get from 80 to 10. And we know that all this took 90 minutes. What we don't know is what the half-life is itself. Well, it's an easy calculation. You just divide the elapsed time by the number of half-lives, three, which will give you 30 minutes. And that makes sense, because 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and we're down to 10. Practice these as many times as possible so you become quite confident at these. And that is how you explain the term half-life and how to calculate it. Finally, we're going to look at radioactive decay curves. These come up a lot in exams as well, and it's very important you can read them accurately. And they're very easy to read, really. On the y-axis, you have radioactivity or activity in becquerels. You could also have mass, or you could also have a percentage. But on the x-axis, you'll always have time. It may be in millions of years, years, thousands of years, seconds. Here, I've got it in hours. And as you can see, as time continues to go on, the radioactivity falls, as you would expect, because the undecayed nuclei start to decay and continue to decay. The radioactivity levels never actually reach zero, but they get very close. The best way to understand how to use these graphs is apply it to some questions. So here's some examples of some questions you could get. It might ask you, quite simply, to estimate the half-life of a specific radioisotope using the decay curve. It's so easy. What you do is you find the maximum radioactivity, which would be on this axis here, so 100 in my case, but it could be 900, 600, 6 million, it doesn't matter. I've used nice easy numbers. Then you half that figure, so a half of 100 would be 50. Then you basically read off the graph. You go across until you meet the curve, then down to get the time. So the half-life of this radioisotope is six days, and that makes sense because you can see every six days the radioactivity is halving. So another six days, we're down to 25 from 50. Another six days, and we're down to 12.5 from 25. And another six days, we're down to 6.25. Let's try another type of question. If a sample has a count of 100 becquerels, how much activity will remain after three half-lives? Well, if you remember, each one of these represents a half-life. So that's one, two, 
3. This time we just go up on our graph and we go across and we read off it and that gives us a reading of 12.5 becquerels. And in the final and most challenging version of these questions, it may say something like this. After a nuclear meltdown, scientists measured the activity in the local area. An activity count of 25 becquerels is regarded as safe. How long will it take for the activity to reach safe levels? So this time, we find 25 on our graph and draw a horizontal line until we meet the curve, then go down. And we can see it's 12 days. Effectively, we're doing the same thing every time. We're just deciding whether to go up from the x-axis and meet the y, or start on the y-axis and go down to meet the x. The final point to make, and it's very important, it does come up a lot again, is whenever you take a radioactivity reading of a sample, it will always be higher than the true radioactivity reading of the sample. So let's say our radioactive counter person is trying to take a reading of uranium's radioactivity. And let's say this curve represents the true reading. However, the reading will actually be higher. And that's because this counter will also be detecting radiation from the background, which we started off this tutorial with. So to get a true reading, you must subtract the background radiation reading from the reading of the sample, because the reading of this sample isn't just a sample. It's this plus background radiation. So you must minus background radiation to get just the sample's reading. How you do this is you take several readings of background radiation using a GM tube or GM counter, and this is to ensure you account for local variations and get a reliable average. So you would take readings at various points in your local area. When you have enough, you'd get an average reading. And then what you do is you subtract the average reading from every sample reading. So for every reading you took of uranium, you'd have to subtract the background radiation reading. Only then will you get the true uranium decay curve. And that is how you explain how to interpret decay curves or half-life graphs.